Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on processing in memory. Today, we continue talking about another real world processing in memory architecture, Samsung HBM PIM, which was the first uh, PIM architecture announced by Samsung about two years ago. Remember that we started this series of lectures about real world PIM architectures, talking about AppMem, the AppMem PIM, that is based on DDR4 DIM modules and basically consists of placing small processors called DPUs inside the DRAM chips. As you may remember, inside, uh, on each uh, AppMem DIM, there are 16 chips, and inside each uh, PIM chip, there are eight DRAM banks that are called NRAM banks and eight. DRAM processing units or DPUs. Today, we talk about Samsung HPM PIM, which was also uh, called FIM DRAM. This HPM PIM or FIM DRAM architecture was first announced two, about two years ago by Samsung and is an architecture targeted at machine learning and artificial intelligence. It was first presented at the ISSCC conference in 2021, this short paper, and later at ISCA 2021. The same year, it was also presented at the uh, Hot Chips Symposium. HVM PIM, as its name uh, indicates, is based on HVM memory. Let me give you very briefly a background on HVM memory. HVM, high bandwidth memory, stacks DRAM layers and a buffer layer. This buffer layer uh, basically contains the IO circuitry for communication uh, with the host, with the CPU or the GPU, and um, another circuitry for self-test and debug. Uh, basically, HVM stacks on top of each other DRAM layers and the buffer layer, and they communicate uh, using uh, lines or, or wires called through silicon bias or TSBs. In this figure, you can see uh, the two uh, stacks or two uh, cubes of HVM memory uh, on, at both sides of the host, either a CPU or a GPU, and you can also identify the different DRAM layers or dies. They are connected to the buffer die using these through silicon bias and then the buffer die is connected to the host through a silicon interposer. One HVM die and HVM2 die comprises four pseudo channels, each with four band groups. So as you see, this is the HVM DRAM die, and you can identify here one pseudo channel com uh, composed of these uh, band groups zero to three. An access transfers an access to the HVM memory. A transfer uh, moves 2,256 bits, a, a data block of 256 bits over four 64-bit uh, bursts over one pseudo channel. The basic idea in FIM DRAM or in HVM PIM is to exploit the internal bandwidth that all these banks can provide at the same time. And, that's, and that, this can be really beneficial for certain memory bound applications, such as those or algorithms, such as those in BLAST1 and BLAST2. Instead of uh, accessing the uh, memory, through the channels, through the memory channel, as we normally do in conventional processor-centric systems, which is very limited by the uh, narrow channel that we have here, the narrow memory bus. The basic idea is to place compute units near the memory banks, and this way we can sustain much more aggregated bandwidth. We can take a look at the uh, chip structure. So what Samsung did was modifying the stack of HVM2 memory and uh, placing some small uh, units, CMD units, as we will see, called PCUs in some of the layers. As you see in the uh, chip structure of HVM within DRAM, there are still some layers that are uh, conventional DRAM layers just for storage. And there are also some other layers that are for computation, FIM DRAM or HVM PIM layers. Here we can take a look at the chip implementation. And uh, besides these uh, peripheral control block and TSBs that we see here at the center of the die, we can also identify the four pseudo channels, one, 
two, three, and four. And in each of the pseudo channel, we see the different band groups. Inside the, in the band groups and in between two DRAM banks, there are these PCU blocks. As you will see, one PCU block every two cell arrays, bank eight and bank nine, for example, in this part here. And here uh, we see uh, another view of this system organization where the slide compares HVM2, conventional HVM2 and thin DRAM. Instead of uh, you know, just placing, um, and instead of just having two banks uh, with the corresponding column decoders and the uh, input output sense amplifiers, uh, in the middle of the two banks, uh, thin DRAM places this PCU block that uh, it's connected to, in this case, bank zero and bank one. And as we can see uh, in this part of the figure, the PCU block has access to both banks through uh, 256 paths, or at least it can access 256 bits at the same time. The design of uh, FinDRAM follows uh, certain goals. First of all, support for uh, FinDRAM and FinDRAM mode for versatility. So it's possible to use this as conventional memory and also use that PIM memory. And as well, as well as minimize the engineering cost of redesigning the DRAM banks and the server arrays. And for that reason, the PIM unit is placed at the IO boundary of a bank, as uh, we can see in this part of the figure. As, as we already said, and as you can also see in the figure, there are there is one PIM unit for each every for every two banks. And this PIM unit, <clears throat> it's basically as in the unit, as we see on this part of the figure. And uh, this in the unit has 16 lanes, and each of them is uh, the, the width of each of them is 16 bits. These are floating point units and are able to execute, multiply, and accumulate operations, multiply and add operations. As I said, these are SIMD units, and as you may remember, SIMD is a paradigm, a compute paradigm that consists of a single instruction operating on multiple data elements. And this can be done in time or in space. Basically, we have an array of multiple execution units or multiple processing elements or PEs. And, uh, and we have what we call a time-space duality. This distinguishes between uh, two types of SIMD processors. On the one hand, we can have array processors where instruction operates on multiple data elements at the same time using different spaces. Or we can have a vector processor where an instruction operates on multiple uh, data elements in consecutive time steps using the same space. In order to exemplify these two uh, types of CMD processors, let's take a look at this slide. As you see on the left-hand side, we have the array processor with four processing elements from P0 to P3. On the right-hand side, we have the vector processor with four processing elements that are specialized for different instructions, as you see. Here on the left-hand side of the slide, we can see an instruction string composed by a load instruction, an add, multipli a multiplication, and a an store instruction. How are these instructions executed over time and in space on these array and vector processor? In the case of the array processor, we start issuing uh, the load instruction of the four processing elements at the same time, then the addition, then the multiplication, and finally the store operation. In the vector processor, we will start first with the load of the first element of the vector, LD0, then the second element of the vector, LD1, and at the same time, the addition for the first element of the vector at zero. And then we continue like that, uh, creating this pipeline for uh, the, the second element, third element, and so on. So as we can see in the array processor, we execute the same operation at the same time, while in the vector processor, we execute different operations at the same time. And in the array processor, we execute different operations in the same space, while in the vector processor, we execute the same um, operation in the same space because the execution units are specialized. 
This is just a very brief introduction or a very brief uh, refresher on CMD processors. But if you want to uh, refresh more, you can take a look at some of our lectures. For example, this one where we introduce CMD processors and GPUs that are another type of CMD processor that is widely available and widely used these days. OK, let's go back to CMD RAM, to the system organization. The PIM units respond to standard DRAM column commands like reads and writes and they are compliant with a modified JEDEC controllers. They execute one white CMD operation commanded by a PIM instruction with deterministic latency in a lockstep manner. They execute in lost, a lockstep, which is common in CMD processors, and their execution is commanded by uh, uh, instructions that are received by commands that are received from the memory controller, as we'll see. A PIM unit can get 16 16 bit operands either from the input output sense amplifiers, from a register that the PCUs or the PIM units contain, or uh, their result mass. This is, uh, you, can, you can see this clearly here. For each of the elements, for each of the lanes in the CMD unit, data can come either from the cells or from the IO sense amplifiers that we see here at the bottom of the bank. Uh, from registers, registers that are inside the CMD units, inside the PCUs or PIM units, or they can come from the result, right? As we see from this uh, result bus. Remember that the uh, key for FinDRAM or HVM PIM to improve performance for memory bound workloads is that we can exploit bank level parallelism. Unlike the standard DRAM devices, all banks can be accessed concurrently, and these can result in eight times higher bandwidth when we have 16 banks per pseudo channel. Um, in order to go to the P mode, there is a sequence of command to go from the, let's say, conventional single bank mode where we can access one bank uh, at the same time with a certain sequence of commands that is specified here that are sent by the memory controller, we can move to this all bank mode that um, allows uh, accessing all banks at the same time or multiple rows in all banks at the same time. And then <clears throat> by modifying one bit, we can go to the P mode, as you can see. And in that, at this point, it's possible to execute instructions, execute operations in the PCUs. Um, the uh, instructions are, the, the instruction execution is triggered by memory commands that um, the PCUs receive. Uh, there is uh, something that we have to clarify here, is the fact that uh, the bandwidth, the maximum aggregated bandwidth that we can obtain when we uh, activate all banks at the same time is eight times higher instead of 16, even though we have 16 banks. But the reason for that is due to the DRAM timing parameters. When we want to access two back-to-back uh, uh, -back, um, um, uh, columns, um, so we, when we want to access back-to-back -back two columns inside the same bank, we have to wait a latency that is TCCDL. And this latency TCCDL is basically twice the latency TCCDS that we have to respect when we access rows in different um, in different banks inside inside the same bank group. So that's the basic reason why we are not obtaining 16 times higher bandwidth, but only eight times higher bandwidth. Um, as I said earlier, in the AB in mode a memory command from the uh, memory controller triggers a PIM instruction that resides in the CRF, in the common register file, which is basically like the uh, instruction memory of these PCUs. But now let's take a closer look at the PCUs themselves, at the programmable compute units or PCUs. As you can see in this part of the uh, slide, uh, the, here in the middle, we have the PCU. It has access to an even number bank and an odd number bank. Uh, and to access each of them, there is a, the corresponding interface. We can also see that inside the PCU, there is a multiplier uh, for 16-bit uh, floating point numbers and another. And then there are general purpose register files. And there are also uh, control 
register file and uh, special purpose register file, as we are going to see more clear in the uh, next slide. And then there is also this control unit here. So this control unit is like the instruction sequence manager that basically is in charge of fetching the next instruction or triggering the next instruction. And then there, are, there is a pipeline, simple pipeline with five stages. The first stage is fetch and decode. Second one is optional, that is loading 256 bit data from the event or the odd bank, then the multiplier, then the other. Remember that this is for machine learning and artificial intelligence and multiply and add operations are the basic operations in many, many of these workloads. And finally, we have the write back to the general register file. Here we have another view of the PCU where we can identify the interface unit that is part of the control unit. Let's say this one receives uh, signals, receives the commands from the memory controller, but also addresses and also the clock of the PCU. Here we see this CRF sequencer that is in charge of um, uh, going to the CRF, the instruction memory that contains 32 b 32 32 bit, 32 um, entries or instructions. And, um, and once <clears throat> we fetch one new instruction from the CRF, uh, it's uh, decoded in this pipeline decoder. Then it goes to the um, multiply array. And then it goes to the other array. And uh, data is fetched from whatever is needed, either from the banks or from the general register file or from the result bus, as uh, you may remember from our previous slide. So we have the interface unit to control the data flow, and we have the execution unit here in the middle and the register group. Remember that the uh, register group is composed by the CRF command register file, which is instruction buffer or instruction memory. And we have the general register file uh, for operands, like weights and accumulation, as we need in neural networks, for example. And then we have this source re uh, register file for constants for the multiply and accumulate operations. Regarding the instruction set architecture is pretty simple. It's a nine risk style 32-bit instructions that we have here in, the, in this table. There are different types, floating point, data path, and control path. And um, you can take a look at them, but uh, let's highlight, for example, the addition, multiplication, multiply and accumulate, or multiply and add operations. And then we have move instructions to load and store data. This move instruction is also able, if one specific bit in the instruction format is set, this move instruction is also able to execute a ReLU operation. As you know, um, very much use activation function in uh, many uh, neural networks, such as CNNs. And then there are a few more uh, control instructions like knobs or this jump instruction that is needed whenever we want to execute again a sequence of instructions that has been previously loaded on the CRF. Remember that <clears throat> the CRF is pretty small, only 32, bit instru 32 instructions. Uh, so uh, sometimes we may want to uh, execute operations on a larger tile. And this is the uh, operation flow, the operation sequence in this uh, example for a matrix uh, for matrix vector computing. Um, input and output data are accessible to the host in a conventional DRO operation. Uh, so same as usual after power up our initialization, if we are not in the DRAM or HVM mode or the P mode, uh, we have conventional DRAM operation where we can write and read uh, from data cells. But if we are in the PIM mode, then the host needs to first store data in the cells. This is the input data for the matrix vector uh, operation. Then it changes the mode from normal to P mode, and then the uh, execution starts on the PCUs. Um, there is, uh, first of all, the need to, um, uh, to load uh, the, the program register file with the both uh, with instructions and weight data, and then um, it starts the execution of the PIN um, operations. And this is commanded by the external signals that the memory controller is going to send after an activate. It will send read and write instructions for the sequencer to go to the CRF and fetch new instructions that will be executed on the uh, pipeline. At some point, the PIN operation will finish. If we are done, 
we just go out and uh, change again the mode to normal so that the data is accessible by the host, the calculated results. Uh, but eventually we may want to go again to the beginning of this um, sequence of three steps and program again the register file with instructions and, and new weighted data. Regarding the data flow, so how we access data here, either from the host or from the PCUs, this is basically controlled by the operation mode, which can be either normal or P mode or FIM mode. And then there is a, also this bit uh, RA13, uh, which is basically um, needs to be set. Uh, for uh, PCU registers. That's basically a, a, um, a, 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 the, the 13th row address uh, bit needs to be high. And this is necessary, as uh, we can see here, for data, rate, data write to the PCU register. So it is um, uh, number six, as we see, is when we are writing something to the PCU registers, for example, instructions, for example, constants to the SRF, etc. The rest of cases, we see um, either the normal operation with the host writing or reading to the cell array, and then uh, we have the data movement from the PCU and the cell array or vice versa, either reads or writes. This slide finally shows one key feature summary here on the right hand side. You can see uh, FinDRAM uh, with uh, you know, different uh, characteristics, uh, specifications in, ten, in terms of the DRAM process, memory density, bandwidth, number of uh, processing units, et cetera, or the frequency. Uh, this is just for your reference. Uh, it's comparing to other uh, architectures, for example, the admin team architecture. Um, as you see, these a uh, table comes from one of the papers about FinVirum, and it's just for your reference. And I don't think that it really makes sense to compare different architectures just directly. As you may remember, Admin Beam is a more general purpose architecture that follows, it, it, it has uh, in order cores that are fine grain multi-threaded, while FinVirum is more specialized, has a more a limited instruction set and is, um, is a CIMD uh, architecture. So I don't think that they are directly compatible, but it's good to see uh, some numbers here in this comparison table for reference. This is basically all in this short introduction to the uh, HVM team architecture. Um, I just want to refer you to a longer lecture if you want to learn more details um, uh, uh, about, about uh, this architecture. It's a lecture from uh, basically one uh, hour duration and, and it's a, a lecture from a previous semester. And this one is, a, is another one, is, is from, a, from a different semester. Um, there are not so many novelties about uh, or, or recently about HVMP, but the last thing I heard um, is uh, what I show you in this slide. Um, it's uh, I'm, I'm not spending much on this because it's not coming from a pure peer reviewed paper, uh, but um, but it's a I think an interesting experience that you can check in the uh, in this uh, post uh, that you see the link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, basically, Samsung did one experiment where they placed or they replaced the conventional HVM2 memory uh, in AMD GPUs with HVMP memory, and they um, uh, compared to a baseline without HVMP memory, and they observe apparently something around two times performance improvement and energy savings. I think this is uh, pretty good news, and hopefully uh, we will see more and we will learn more about uh, this experiment and about uh, other experiments with uh, other uh, neural networks uh, in, in the near future. This is basically all for today. Um, I will invite you. I would like to invite you to uh, the upcoming lectures where we will continue talking about real world PIM architectures, and also we will talk about how to program PIM systems, workload characterization for PIM suitability, research proposals, etc. So, thank you much. For, thank you very much for your attention. See you in the next lecture.